Well, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on preparing for success with hybrid events. My name is Emily Counts and I'm the program associate here at ACCE. My colleague Susan McGuire is also here today. Before I introduce the all-star team from the Gwinnett Chamber, I have some housekeeping items for you and then we will hit the ground running. All attendees are currently muted and will stay muted for the duration of this program to avoid background noise. We highly encourage your questions today. Please submit your questions through the chat feature throughout the presentation. We will do our best to get to every question, but if it is unanswered, we will follow up with you following the webinar. We recommend using speaker mode for today's presentation, which you can select, but you can select your setting in the top right corner of your Zoom window. We are recording this webinar and it will be available on our ACCE University page tomorrow, barring any technical difficulties. So without further ado, I will introduce the team from the Gwinnett Chamber of Commerce. So first we have Ken Rutherford. He serves, serves the Gwinnett Chamber as the Vice President of Branding and Communications. Ken came to the chamber in 2006 after a 20 year career in graphic design and marketing. He oversees the branding communications of the Gwinnett Chamber, as well as its economic development initiative, Partnership Gwinnett. His team is responsible for all of the Chamber's development and for all of the Chamber's marketing communications design and AV productions. Lena Teinobaum serves the Gwinnett Chamber as one of their program and event managers. Lena came to the Chamber in 2019. She is passionate about being the spark that creates the change, so much so that during her tenure as event manager, she planned and initiated numerous major fundraising events within the Atlanta nonprofit sector. Lena is in charge of four annual events, 16 monthly program events, and 10 webinar events a year at the Gwinnett Chamber. One of her key strengths is developing relationships with people from all walks of life. And then last but definitely not least is Sarah Persing. A Southwest Georgia native, Sarah Persing currently serves as the membership development manager for the Gwinnett Chamber, focusing on creative ways to cultivate relationships among members. Prior to her time at the Gwinnett, at the Gwinnett Chamber, she served as the executive director for the Carol Grady County Chamber of Commerce in rural Southwest Georgia. Sarah currently resides in Dawsonville with her husband and her son, Cohen. So without further ado, team from Gwinnett, I hand things over to you. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate it very much. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, what we hope is going to be an interesting and uh, informative webinar for you or a seminar for you. Um, we have been successfully hosting high quality, I hope, hybrid events uh, for oh, almost a year now. And we found that we had to do this because we generate more than 20% of our revenue from events, from charging admission, sponsorships, et cetera. And so when we were faced with the shutdown, it not only threatened that revenue, but it also threatened our dues revenue since most of our members perceive their greatest value to being a member of our chamber to be the networking opportunities that are afforded by our events. So we knew immediately that we wouldn't be able to keep this organization afloat by just doing virtual events alone. We had to figure out a way to get people safely live and virtual at the same time. Sarah. So with, with all of that knowledge that we had of what we knew we needed to do, we put our heads together and decided to come up with a plan um, to provide a safe environment for our members, investors, sponsors, um, even guests um, to gather in person at the same time, um, providing high quality, high value experience for those who chose, uh, for those who chose to attend our events online. Lena? Yep, we also thought about what technology would be necessary to do it right. We consulted with experts about how we could safely bring people into our facility, and we came up with some great ways to make our online experience worthwhile, an experience that our members would and investors would absolutely pay for as well. Ken? So for this presentation, we're going to share with you some of the things that we learned, some of the mistakes that we made, and maybe hopefully encourage you to set the pace for your members as more and more companies are getting back to live events, more and more organizations are getting back to live events. Um, so we're going to classify our hybrid events in roughly two different levels, um, simple and then again, not so simple. Um, this way you can either uh, just dip your toe in the water or you can jump in headfirst. 
and at the end, we'll save some time for questions and answers. You can just type your questions in the chat, the little word balloon at the bottom of your screens, and Sarah will read them to us, or she might just decide to wait till the end to do that. All right, so we're gonna start off with what it takes to hold a simple hybrid event. And what we mean by simple is that this would be an event with minimal technology needs. And all of the talkers, and I'm gonna call them talkers instead of speakers, but I may mess up and call them speakers. And the reason I call them talkers is because a speaker is typically that electronic thing that makes noise come out. So I wanna to try to talk about the people who are speaking at your events as talkers. So this would be an event with minimal technology needs where all of the talkers are in the same place, live and in the room. They're speaking one at a time. And so in this case, all you would need would be a camera and a microphone that would capture your live speaker or talker for your online audience. And so Sarah, talk about what kind of ideas we came up with to increase the value to our online audience. Okay, so I am um, a little bit of background about me as I am our, I guess you would call me our resident networker here at the Gwinnett Chamber. Um, the bulk of what my responsibility is, is to coordinate our networking events. And we currently have about 125 roughly networking specific events. Um, and people attend in-person events for that networking component, whether it is a network specific event, um, a luncheon where they are um, hearing from a speaker about a specific topic um, or whether it's, you know, something to help with their continuing education hours for human resource management, they attend to be able to network with others. So we added, um, knew that it was necessary for the online component to be able to add a networking time prior to the event. Um, in person, this would be for a lunch event or for a breakfast event. This would be before a meal is served. And so while the in-person event was going on, we decided we could use that time for our online attendees to network with each other. And so I kind of stepped in and planned um, just some very low-key um, networking opportunities for those online attendees to participate in. That included just kind of going around the room and seeing who was in the room and um, letting them introduce themselves to everyone in the room. Um, I made trivia for everybody. I'm a big trivia buff, love trivia, um, love to play trivia. I lose all the time, but I loved to develop trivia for these events. Um, we created one specific to each event. If our uh, luncheon was on the state of the schools, it was, are you smarter than a fifth grader? If it was for um, a, a predominantly woman attended event, it was women in history. Um, so tweaking it based on um, the event itself, what the event entails and who's in the room with you. And that goes into knowing who's going to be in the room before you jump in um, helped tremendously because it helped everyone be engaged um, and be active. Um, and the trivia kind of sparked a little bit of competition, um, a little bit of um, friendly banter with each other. Um, and so that got everybody talking and got everybody more engaged. We also for specific events where we had live talkers, Ken, yeah. where we had live talkers, <laughs> we would have them come to the um, come to the area where I was networking before with everyone online. Um, ask them fun questions. Just give them give the online attendees a little bit more engagement one on one ish with the live talkers that we had at our events. That was something that the those attendees that attended in person, they didn't get to experience that. They didn't get the fun questions. They didn't get to hear what um, Juanita Valles, they didn't get to hear what her favorite book was as a child or her best family vacation memory. Um, so adding things that are exclusive to online attendees was something that we, um, in planning these events, really drove home and really tried to focus on. Great, Sarah, thank you. Lena, talk about some of the ideas that we came up with to motivate our online audience to want to pay to attend our events. Yes, on top of everything that Sarah said that we did to, with our virtual attendees, we needed to add a little something else. So for our monthly on topics, we partnered with a local restaurant and we paid them $10 for a $20 gift card. Our then virtual attendees can register for this event. They paid $55 and would receive a $20 gift card to this restaurant. Um, they really enjoyed this. The reason we did it was because it, 
they were used to doing a luncheon, coming and sitting down and they got that networking piece while Sarah did it with them. But then we wanted to say, hey, if you wanna order that lunch, deliver it to your house, eat it while we were presenting and they could hear from that great speaker. So we wanted them to have that same atmosphere. For our Moxie Awards, which was their bigger awards program, we wanted to do something special with our women that attended virtually. So like Sarah said, they were on there playing women's trivia, as well as getting to hear from our different panelists, questions that they were not going to hear from the actual live event. They also, we partnered with four local women-owned businesses where we paid them $10 for a $20 gift card. Each virtual attendee would get a $20 gift card and they would tell us which local um, business they wanted to use it for. On top of that, we partnered with Kendra Scott and they gave us a 20% off for all of our virtual attendees. This went over very well as this is a woman's event. They felt very, they felt like they were helping a lot of women owned businesses by doing this. Um, so both of those were very successful. Great. Um, we'll go back over some of these ideas and I'm sure you may have a lot of questions. And so if, as was told earlier, just go ahead and, and type your questions into the chat and Sarah can collect all these. Um, the next part, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology and unfortunately um, it, I can really get into that and get into a lot of detail. I'm gonna to try to keep it as little detail as possible, but I have provided for you an equipment list. So a lot of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about, you can just simply go to the equipment list that is available. I believe that the link is in the chat um, and you can look at the equipment list and I've actually linked right to the, those, the equipment on Amazon if you wanna buy, and I don't have any stock in Amazon, but you can go straight to Amazon and purchase that, some of that stuff. Obviously, um, if you're not super techie, I wouldn't tell you to just go out and buy the technology because you got to be able to use the technology. But I want to tell you about how to do it in a simple way a little bit. I'm going to switch now to my slides. Um, the simplest way that you could uh, do this is to put a laptop computer, a computer in front of the speaker and use its built-in camera and microphone, as you see in the picture there just using the camera right there on the, on the laptop, the built-in microphone. Better still though, would be if you were to get a webcam and mount it on a tripod. And you can get webcams for pretty inexpensive, well under a hundred dollars. And most webcams have a built-in microphone, but I prefer to use an external microphone. And so I have, um, one actually sitting in front of me here that's an external that I purchased. The link is on the equipment list and you just plug it into the USB on a computer off to the side. So the, here's some things I recommend if you do this. If you use a laptop and uh, for the camera and the mic, make sure you have somebody else in the room be the host on a separate computer so that you're on one computer and they're on another. And then they should wear headphones so they can monitor how it sounds online. That person who is on that separate computer would share the speaker's PowerPoint. That person would control the muting of all the mics and cameras of your online attendees. Uh, we actually have someone online doing that for this, this meeting. It's very important that you uh, don't set your speaker up to have to control all that when you're trying to do something as complex as a live and online event because you got live people watching and you don't want somebody fumbling around with, with their computer. Uh, we also learned that if you um, use an external camera and a mic, the USB signal, as you see, I'm showing you on this slide, going from the computer to the microphone, if you use an external camera and microphone, a USB signal can only travel about 15 feet. And I learned that the hard way. So you're gonna to need to position your laptop and your operator of your laptop pretty close to the speaker. And so you think, oh my goodness, I don't wanna be sitting up, if I'm doing running the computer, I don't wanna be sitting up at a table right next to the speaker and everybody's looking at me while they're listening to our speaker live. Well, there is an option there and it's not cheap, and you can extend the camera and mic USB signal with a booster, and I've got a picture here of what that looks like. Um, these are not cheap. I've linked to them in the equipment list. 
I actually bought mine on eBay used and I spent way less than I would retail. I bought them from a church. They weren't using them anymore. They had upgraded to a new, new version. You can find these on eBay. And so that's what I did. I bought, I bought two sets. So we have the ability to use two different sets, but you can plug two things into this particular extender at a time. So I can plug my mic and my camera in it, extend that up to hundred feet or even more using cat six cable, which is the same cable that you plug your ethernet into for your networking on your computer. And you can extend it all the way across the room. So I've actually uh, in our, in the big ballroom events that we do, we have the camera, the mic and the camera up in front of the stage. And we go hundred feet away to the tech table and we can run it from there. And it's not a problem. So like I said, all this is included in the equipment list. Another thing that is very, very important is lighting. And so you can see here, we use a ring light. I actually have about three of them. Lena's sitting in front of one of them right now, and I'm sitting in front of one, I'm standing in front of one of them. But you position this behind the camera, and this is gonna give your subject, their speaker, a professionally lighted look without spending a fortune on camera lights. Now, it does kind of get in their way in a live event, and we've just gotten used to that. And our, I think our audience is used to it. They recognize that we say, hey, this is for our Zoom or our online streaming attendees or whatever. And they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty understanding of that. Now, also you wanna make sure that your talkers all know that they are on camera and that they can't move around. So what we do to kind of force that is we mount a, uh, a microphone on a stand a room mic that is actually goes to the PA system. And so if you move away from this, you can't be heard on the PA system. And that tells our talkers, don't move. You got to, you're in front of a camera. Some people are tempted to kind of weave back and forth and rock and everything. If they are, if they've got that microphone right in front of them, that's going to keep them in one spot. And it, it keeps them from being tempted to moving out in front of the camera. And finally, do not put your talker in front of a window or another source of bright light. We use a backdrop with our logo on it. You saw it when I was on camera. Um, we also, here's a picture of our county sheriff in front of our backdrop. And he is got the ring light in front of him, the camera in front of him, and he's speaking to a room full of people. And he's also talking to many people on, on Zoom. Um, we also use a green screen and I bought this as a roll of paper, basically, and, and you can get the, this type of thing. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, but if you're going to use the virtual background uh, for Zoom, only do it with the green screen. Don't do it without the green screen. It, it's cool, but it's just not professional. And so I would strongly recommend that you get a green screen. However, that does not look great behind a live speaker. So we tend to try to avoid the green screen when we're doing live and well hybrid events, live and online at the same time. So enough of me, Lena, talk about some of the ways that we ensure that our attendees understand what to expect from a hybrid event if they attend live or if they attend online. Right, when our att attendees register, they'll receive an email that has all of the information about what their virtual or live experience would be like. This email will host, will have the agenda for the day or afternoon or morning. Um, it will have the Zoom link and the password. It will also have our COVID protocols. We also, when we first started, came back to the office, we had a video that Sarah was actually the startup, which showed them what they would be walking into just so no one felt like they didn't know what they were doing. Um, we also send that, send that same email a day before and the day of the event so that everyone knows and is on the same page. So Sarah, talk about some of the things that you learned, maybe some of the things that we had to um, pivot from your experience of hosting online networking sessions. Sorry, unmute myself. You think after a year of this, I'd know how to unmute <laughs> myself. <laughs> That's probably one of them. Um, remembering, to, <laughs> remembering to unmute yourself. Um, no, but a lot of the things that you run into with hosting networking sessions online is a lot different and you wouldn't the concept you wouldn't think would be that different um, in person and, um, and virtual, but it is. Um, there is that component 
with virtual networking that people feel almost like they don't have to interact with anybody because they are not, um, they're not face to face and they're not standing next to someone and they're not feeling like they have to work the room. Um, so really the thing to focus on and that we've had to focus on and I've had to focus on with all the networking programs that we've done is making people feel comfortable and making people feel at ease. Um, and it, it's a lot more work. And when I tell you it's a lot more work virtual than in person is a lot more work virtual in person. And I'm sure a lot of you have done um, plenty of virtual networking um, programs since all of this is all, you know, this whole uh, virtual world has, has come to be our existence. Um, but it's, it's about knowing who's in the room. It's about knowing who your attendees are, um, feeling comfortable enough to call some of those people out and call on them and start a conversation with them in front of everyone um, so that other people then feel comfortable jumping in on the conversation or other people feel comfortable if you were to call on them participating in a conversation. Um, it's all about making it fun. Um, getting everybody active, like I mentioned earlier, getting everybody participating and um, interacting with each other. The more fun you make it, the more lighthearted you make it, the more people are, um, th the more likely they are to participate and to answer questions and to um, participate in a, an icebreaker activity. You know, as adults, we tend to think, icebreakers those are games like I don't I'm like I'm not a kid I'm an adult I don't want to play that um don't call them icebreakers don't call them games call them something else make that something relevant to the people that are in the room but I, the biggest thing that I would tell you is know who's in the room know who's gonna be in the room and be prepared for anything I'll call them revenue enhancers revenue enhancers that's what you can call them <laughs> so what we just outlined is going to get you going on a simple hybrid event. And that may have blown your mind. It, we, we can answer questions when the Q&A time comes up. Um, but I'm I do- I'm copying them. I'm sorry? I'm copying them and pasting oh, them. Excellent, great. So uh, I, we have to kind of move beyond just the simple because nothing is just so simple, right? And the more complexity that you add to a live environment, the more complex the production becomes. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the first curveballs that we were thrown when we were doing hybrid events is that some of our talkers were virtual. We had some live and some virtual. Uh, we did a, a virtual Washington DC fly-in and we had quite a few people here. And then we had some people speaking to us from Washington DC that we had to bring in so that the live and the virtual could get those at the same time. It was a challenge. Um, what if you have multiple talkers in the live presentation, for example, a panel discussion? Well, you think, okay, they can do like the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Those of you who are not my age don't know what I'm talking about, but they gather together and sing into the same microphone. That doesn't work when you're trying to do social distancing and people don't want to be that close. And so you got to be able to spread them out, which means multiple cameras, and multiple microphones. And as if you've played around with Zoom much, that's not so easy to do. There's also the question of what if you're holding a roundtable meeting and you want to include your online participants in the discussion and your online attendees want to be able to see and hear the live attendees. That's a big challenge as well. So I'm not going to get into all of the little technical details for fear of boring you but I will cover some of the things that you need to consider probably from a more of a, like a 15,000 foot level, all right? So first of all, if your live audience needs to see and hear a virtual talker, somebody comes in like we did in our Washington DC fly-in, we had the Secretary of Transportation speak to the entire group live and online. You gotta have a way to present the picture and sound to the whole room. For small groups of fewer than 10, you might be able to use a computer with a large monitor and just position it such that people can see it with, and have good speakers that um, they, they can hear the voice. But if it gets to be a larger group, you're gonna need to use a projector and a sound system and mirror your computer screen or match the, the, the display of your computer screen on that projector 
or maybe a large screen TV if you have access to one. These are all things you need to be thinking about and you need to test it out before you get into it. If your meeting includes multiple talkers, like a panel discussion, then you're gonna need to have multiple microphones and even multiple cameras. Now, Zoom is great. I love their technology, but they're going to only allow you to use one audio source. An audio source is a microphone. They're only going to be allowed to use one audio source at a time. So we needed to figure out a way, how am I going to get, without people handing a microphone back and forth and that being kind of clunky, how are we going to be able to let people speak at the same time um, with different microphones and bring all of that sound into one central controller and then bring that controller signal into the computer as a single audio source. I'm trying to stay as non-technical as possible, but it's really not hard to do if you can think through it. Luckily, years ago, we invested in a portable PA system that we could use at uh, ribbon cuttings and, and other events that were offsite well, that portable PA system, which I have a picture of here, right here on the slide, it's called a Fender Passport. You can get those on Amazon and I gave you the link to it. Um, you can use five microphones on that. You know, folks don't wanna share a microphone, especially in this time. So initially what we did is we simply set up the PA system and then put our external microphone next to the speaker, not the talker, but the speaker. We put it next to the speaker so it would just pick up the sound coming out of that speaker. But later I realized that's not as elegant as it needs to be. So I purchased this little cool little device called a preamp. Um, I've got that on, on uh, Amazon and I've left you the link, of course, on the, on the equipment list. And that way, all I got to do is go straight out of that PA system into the preamp and then from the preamp, go right into the computer. It's really very simple and it's one signal. And Zoom looks at it like one microphone, even though you have five. And you can also use the Bluetooth on it and play music through it too. There's all kinds of cool things you can do with, a, with that portable PA system. So if, I've, uh, if I'm keeping you and you're staying with me, I'm gonna talk about a couple more things. If your virtual talker, virtual talker, needs to see your live audience, whew, that's always a huge challenge because now what you got to do is set up another computer in the room and aim its camera or external webcam towards the audience. First of all, I want to show you an image. This is an actual panel discussion that we did where each speaker had their own microphone. And uh, we set up two cameras and I just switched back and forth between those cameras in Zoom. But Here's an image. I got Sam, my famous uh, production man here right next to me. And he is our audience, our live audience. Just assume there's a lot more of him there. Well, you can say, take your a camera from your computer and simply set it up in the front of the room aimed towards the people in the audience. And there the, the virtual talker can now see the people. Make sure to mute this, cam this computer and turn off the sound because the audience in the room is gonna hear that. And there's always a delay. Zoom sometimes has a delay up to four to five seconds, believe it or not. And it's, it's very distracting. So turn the sound off and mute that uh, microphone. But now your virtual talker can see everybody in the audience. Another way to do that would just simply use a webcam to do the same thing. Uh, it's a little uh, less intrusive and you can put it on a, on a tripod and usually people don't even see it. There's another cool product on the market. There's a lot of cool products on the market, but this one I've seen, it uh, will facilitate roundtable meetings with live and virtual attendees. And this thing's called the Meeting Owl 360. Um, the good news, it does an am amazing things. You got a 360 degree image. If you look at the top of that screen there, the Zoom screen, you can see everybody in the room. It has eight microphones and it tracks its cameras to the active talker. And so as people speak, all of a sudden they're highlighted and it's all one unit. You don't have to have multiple cameras or anything. You just simply plug this into your computer and Zoom actually sets it up for you and everything. It's really cool. The bad news is it costs a thousand dollars. So if you're ready to make uh, an investment, 
so that you can do roundtable meetings with live and virtual attendees. That's something you can get. I have not invested in one of these yet. Um, we have some friends upstairs who may loan me theirs next week for, for using it. So, And finally, for the really brave and adventurous, we have used some pretty cool products that have enabled me to do studio quality productions without having to purchase tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. We have bought a lot of equipment, but I've been pretty reasonable in, the, in, in my expenses. Um, the first one is a, a pretty cool product that we use for a little while. We don't use it anymore, but it's called Switcher Studio. And it's a monthly service. You, you can either buy it for, or you, you can purchase the service for one time use, or you can subscribe to it monthly. And it allows you to use the later model iPhones, like an iPhone 11, an iPhone 10, or iPhone 11, or, or later, and iPads, particularly pre preferably an iPad Pro. You can use the iPhones as cameras. So they connect to the, to the uh, wireless network. They all connect together. The iPhones, you position them as your camera. And then on the iPad, you actually have, just like in a professional studio, the ability to change camera angles, to add video, to add titles under the camera angles. It is really cool and very powerful. And you do not have to spend a fortune. Uh, I, somebody I carry actually, an iPhone. Can somebody actually just put in the chat that they purchased the Switcher app at the beginning of this year and it's more than paid for itself in the first four years yeah. or first four yeah. months of the year. So. Yeah, it, it's really cool. Uh, now we don't use it anymore and I'll tell you why because uh, in the next section here, but it is really cool. It does require you to, to have some knowledge of, of what, how to produce things, but there's tons of videos out there you can watch and learn how to, how to do it. And you can ramp up pretty quick. But um, the, the cool thing about it is, is that you can share it on Zoom. You can stream it live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, et cetera. Or you can just record your event for later. But it, this, it's very flexible. I used it to actually broadcast a, a live musical in a big theater. And it was very cool. I set up three different iPhones. I carry an iPhone. I had two other colleagues who had iPhones. And I said, OK, you're going to just have to set it on Do Not Disturb and let me use it for the next hour. And we set them up. And the iPhones brought the picture right into my iPad. And I controlled the iPad and controlled what people saw on the event. It was very cool. Now, why don't we use it anymore? Well, we decided to, um, we had some problems with getting, you have to have dedicated Wi-Fi networks that are really robust. And some of the places where we were going, it just wasn't. And so we decided to invest in this little piece of equipment called an Atom Mini, Mini Atom, A-T-E-M, Mini. And it's a piece of equipment that lets you send multiple video sources into Zoom. And you can show PowerPoint and video. So, for example, um, Sam switch back and forth between the slide and my camera feed. See, so he can switch back. And you don't, you know, when on Zoom, when you do a share screen and the guy's playing around and you see him in his computer and then he has to launch the PowerPoint and all like that. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just switch right back and forth simply by pressing one of these buttons on the console. Um, we use regular DSLR cameras. That's a digital single lens reflex camera, the typical kinds of cameras that you can get uh, from consumer level. But as long as they're able to capture video and send an HDMI signal, we use those to capture the video and then we can fade between the camera feed. So if we had another camera set up in here, we could fade back and forth between that camera feed and the one that you're looking at now. And then you can fade back to the PowerPoint if you go back there for me, Sam. So no more watching somebody fumble through the share screen process or that hard break that you have and when you change camera feeds in Zoom when you're using multiple cameras straight out of Zoom. So whew, these are all items that I can tell you more about but if you're not technically minded, you're best just sticking to the simple solutions. And even then, you should try and assign the production responsibility to somebody who's comfortable with technical details, somebody who thinks that way, and not all of us do. Um, which then leads me to my shameless plug, okay? If you'd like consultation on this subject, or even someone to actually produce an event for you, we have recently rolled out 
a new service for our members, investors, and strategic partners. It's called Virtual and Hybrid Event Production Consultation Services. And so we are actually going to members and investors and partners and producing their events for them, these hybrid events for them, uh, using our equipment. And uh, we do all the uh, setup, tear down. We can even just consult with you on how that's done. Uh, this is a value added service. So um, that's part of what we're offering to people. So if you're interested, you can go to our website, which is gwinnettchamber.org. That's two N's and two T's in Gwinnett, G W I N N E T T, chamber.org slash virtual hyphen hybrid hyphen event hyphen production. <laughs> So Lena and Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to add that our friends might need to consider? Lena, you take it away. All right. Um, communication is key when doing a hybrid event. Do not feel like you are over communicating at all to your in-person or your virtual attendees because at some point somebody will write the wrong email in their registration and come day of when you're setting up and getting ready, you will get that email saying, I never received the login. Well, a good way to help with this is if you have a team, have someone on your team have that email that you sent out the day before ready at hand so they can shoot them the login um, as well as the password. Another thing is always have somebody on the back end watching your, um, your webinar or your Zoom um, in case something's going on. So if my camera were to freeze right now and I have no idea and I'm still going, Ken is watching my event. He would type in the chat, hey guys, we ha we're having a technical difficulty. She'll, we'll be right back. Then he would come and let me know. So that's really, really important to always have somebody on the back end watching and also answering questions that maybe I'm not seeing while we're producing. Um, and then lastly, just make sure that you make your virtual events fun. Um, nobody likes to sit there and just listen forever. So engaging your audience is huge and also knowing your audience. Sarah? Um, just kind of reiterate what Lena said, that last point driving at home is knowing your audience. Um, it's virtual events are, like I said before, very, very, very different than in person in many, many aspects. But being able to engage your, um, your online attendees just as much, if not more, than you will, than you engage them when they are in person is huge. Um, knowing who's in the room, being able to have relationships relationships with some people if, it, if it's one person one person starting a conversation will 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 spark other conversations to start so know who's in the room um, be comfortable talking to people if you are not comfortable in front of people or if you have an, an employee that you're wanting to put in charge of virtual networking or whatever and they're not comfortable in front of people in that in that that aspect and that platform don't put them there put somebody in there that could talk to a brick wall I think that's probably why they put me in there because I could talk to this computer screen all day long um, but know who's in the room um, and have them be comfortable being able to spark conversations with people they may not know well great one of the things that um, our president and CEO is really good at whenever he is introducing a speaker, a talker, sorry, whenever he's introducing a talker is he will say, and we want to welcome our online guests. And those of you who are online, we're so happy to have you. And you make them feel like they're just as much a part and they're thought about just as much as the people in the room. So it kind of adds some value to that. So now we're going to jump into the Q and A. Sarah, what questions do we have, if any? All right, we do have some questions. Um, there has been a couple of uh, questions, and Lena, this one gets shot to you. Um, this one's been and been um, repeated a couple of times. We have a few that want the Kendra Scott contact, um, and if you can share what their what their criteria is for consideration um, when you partner with them, because you've partnered with them on um, multiple different um, events. Absolutely. Um, I can have it sent, Ken, in that same link, um, in the same Word document that Ken created for all of you. I can have the contact that we have for the Atlanta office, and I'm sure that they can send you the contacts to wherever you are located. 
Um, Kendra Scott's a really great um, company because they're very into, they're huge into philanthropy. So a piece I didn't say is of those sales that day that were virtual and in person, because we also had them in person, um, a nonprofit that we selected locally received 15% um, of those sales. So that's a really, really great aspect to having them on board. It's just their love for philanthropy. So I can add that Atlanta contact, which hopefully she, um, she can give you the contacts at wherever you are. So let me just clarify what she meant by um, the link. There is a link, I think it's in the chat. Is that correct, Emily? That is correct. Okay, there's a link in the chat. And what that is, it's, it's a Hightail space. It's a place where I can upload files. And so Lena is gonna prepare a document with uh, any links that, that you're asking about now and or any that might come up later in the Q&A. And we will upload that to that link so or to that space so it's not there right now but be on the lookout for it any other questions Sarah oh yes plenty um the next prop next question is Ken um or Lena uh, but probably Ken is there any problem with feedback with the two mics feedback meaning um bad sound feedback the, the whole that's thing. what I'm yes that's what I'm assuming no because we it, it's not the same as a live event, and Sam's going to help me if I say something wrong here. It's not the same as, as when you're speaking into a microphone with live speakers above you. Um, that's what creates a feedback loop. When you're on Zoom, multiple microphones are just bringing a digital signal in, and they're all coming out of that one um, microphone or one, one speaker on your computer. So it's not going to do that. So no, we've never had that problem. We do have that problem uh, with internal PA systems and places where we go. So you need to test that out, of course. And that's what you would do if it wasn't virtual. I hope I answered the question correctly. Um, if he did not answer your question correctly, just drop another question in the chat yeah. and we can go back through and clarify. Um, next question is, have you ever tried to do a hybrid event with the speaker using a wireless or lapel mic and following them if they like to interact with the audience? Ooh. No, we have never done that. Um, I would have to buy some equipment in order to do that. Um, we have the ability to purchase wireless microphones that send a signal to the camera like the one I'm using right now. You'd have to get that. It has a, a transmitter pack on it and the camera actually has a receiver. And so you would walk around and you'd want to use a steady cam for this. You wouldn't want to have somebody just walking around with that because it's going to be shaky and people are going to get nauseated. You, you'd have to do some extra work. So get a steady cam capability. Um, also get a, a wireless microphone. But Jay, you could do that. If you get the equipment, yes. But I've never done it. Okay, the next question is, our biggest challenge with the hybrid event, events has been the AV costs with the hotel venues, even when bringing in their own equipment. Do you have any tips for that? <laughs> well, I just try to haul in as much of my own stuff as possible because of that. Uh, they, they kill us with cost a lot of times, and it certainly is a lot cheaper to get your own equipment if you're going to use it over time. It certainly pays for itself. Um, but I guess Lena can, can the market bear if you just raise the price to cover that? Um, you, you could, we definitely saw a price increase with our AV companies that we use, um, for any events that we produce in 2020, just because of the, whatever reason we did see a price increase. Um, but thankfully we had Ken and our awesome Gwinnett chamber team. And we were, you know, we brought a lot of things in and we were creative because if we would have used their stuff it probably it had already almost doubled in price it would have gone up even more and Ken you can agree with that yeah do you think though that our members and investors would be able to understand if they had a ten dollar surcharge added to it because of technology is that something or maybe raise the price for the the virtual attendees I, I don't know that's I, something yeah that's that's like a tough that's <laughs> I a think tough so one. but we would have to definitely explain on the front end yeah, I think at some point you get to diminishing returns if it's that expensive. And unfortunately, some of these venues don't realize supply and demand. They think because demand is down, they need to raise their price. And that's just backwards. 
Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, there that's how they do business. And it's amazing how many of them do business like that. Sarah? Okay, next question. Can you share more information about the COVID protocol you have put in place for the live environment aspect of your hybrid events? That's up to you, ladies. We can definitely share that with you. We can send you on that same link that can, we will be updating that for you. We'll have what we've been using, um, just a little short version of it. Um, we take temperatures of our attendees as they walk in. We have them sign an affidavit that we created that simply states that they were under 100 degrees, as well as that they are saying that they are not safe coming into our event. It asks for their name and phone number, and that's in the case that someone tells us that they have um, they're not feeling good or they actually tested positive after one of our events, we would call everyone that attended that event. So we're just making sure that everyone feels safe. Um, on top of that, for our larger events, our tables of 10, um, 10 rounds, we would now sit six people at instead of 10 and each table would be six feet apart. Smaller events, we're placing one person at like um, tables, kind of like what you see behind me, one to two people, six feet apart. Um, we have hand sanitizers everywhere. We clean the room before, we clean the room after. Am I missing anything, Ken, Sarah? No, no, you no. hit it off. <laughs> yep, that is what we do. So one of the things that we did back in June before our first live event that we hosted is I made a funny video and I'll post that video, uh, a link to the YouTube for that on, on the, at that same uh, space that you can watch, but it was just a funny video that kind of walked through people through. It wasn't so much to make them laugh, but it was to kind of get them to feel good that we knew what we were doing and had thought through it. And so we had a lot more protocols in place at that time than we do now, uh, but it gave a comfort level for people coming back to live events and it did it in a fun way. And so I'll just leave it at that. You can watch the video and see maybe do something like that to communicate to your folks that, hey, we're, we're not taking this for granted. For sure. All right, the next question, um, I guess I can take the next question. Um, it says, we are always looking for new and unique icebreakers to get the conversation going and cultivating connection. Do you have any examples or ideas to share from your experience? Um, I, I, I could take that one, Ken and Lena, you guys can jump in. Um, but for what I do, um, I kind of have pulled from my, um, my virtual networking programs that I do every week. Um, we have different formats for each week. Um, a lot of them include icebreakers. Um, a lot of them just include just free speech at the, not, well, not free speech there. We do have a cap on what we can talk about, but um, just kind of open dialogue at the beginning. Um, you know, if you're, ha if you have someone, if you have a chamber employee in those networking events that people know and are, are kind of used to, then you have you have an edge up, a leg up for them to be able to speak a little bit more personally, like, hey, how did that, uh, how did that sale go last week? I know you were working on a big sale or have you, we have a, a, a gift basket member that creates these gorgeous gift baskets. You know, I kind of always push to her to, to kind of get conversation started because she's got some kind of, some kind of story to tell about something. Um, we also just kind of play off of the icebreakers that we would do in person. Um, we love to talk about uh, leadership styles um, and the past leaders that we have worked with, or I say we, our networkers have worked with um, versus their kind of leadership styles. We have funny, funny stories to share, um, horror stories, success stories, that kind of thing. So we just kind of pull off of, we've done two truths and a lie before where, you know, I think that's the, that's the everybody's go-to. Um, but one that we, we did in person before we had to move online that I've used before that's been a lot of fun is you get the beach ball and you write a question and you throw it to somebody wherever their left thumb lands is the question they have to answer. Um, I've done that, but I've played, you know, roulette, put everybody's name in a wheel and spun the wheel. And that's the person that has to answer a random question that I pick. Just taking anything you would do in person and making it into a virtual capacity. I mean, you can do that with basically anything. So. We've had so a lot I'm going to come at it. I'm going to come at it from a, a geek angle, nerd angle, <laughs> as if I could. come on, come on. But no, from the from my angle, it would be what's a cool app that 
you have that you've discovered that's really neat? Or what's a, what's a cool piece of software that you've been using? Or what's the latest technology that you've discovered that is really neat? Or what's the next thing that you've learned about? And it's interesting, even people who aren't really technically minded, they find new apps and they are, you know, what's the thing you're spending your screen time on right now? And they can share that. And a lot of those things could be very helpful to people's business and, and their personal life as well. So the next question um, has shown up multiple times. So I'm just going to kind of paraphrase what all of them have collectively said. Um, people want to know um, if we had to add any staff or how many, how many staff members it takes to pull off some of these hybrid events that we're doing. Well, uh, to my right and your left <laughs> is Sam. Well, I turned the camera on him, but uh, he can come here. Come here. Come here. This is Sam Barabin, Hi. and he was hired uh, on at the beginning of March mm -hmm. to be our. Um, tell him about what oh. you're doing. Okay. Well, I'm pretty much um, been taking over as far as AV video stuff. I was the one who kind of figured out this whole setup that we now have going, obviously with Ken's help. I didn't do it on my own, completely on my own. But um, yeah, so uh, could you repeat the well, question? Well, we hired or? you. That's, yes, basically, that, that's basically, it. that's it. So okay. off screen now. Yeah, I, I he's, the, the, he's the, I am the helper in yeah. this, in this whole setup. <laughs> he's the guy off camera. Yes. He's my production right. guy. But no, I Sam is very good. Right. And what, what, what I was looking for when I hired him was somebody who had AV skills. And I was essentially looking for that guy that loved to jump in. And whenever somebody was having problems with their, with the, the computer displaying right on the projector, you know, that guy that can jump right in and figure it right out. Somebody who really likes that, somebody who's very inquisitive, somebody who gets into that. That's me, but I'm busy. I got other things to do. And Sam, that's that described him to a T plus he had skills in video production and he could work well under pressure from what I've seen so far. He's done a great job. So we we brought him on board here in March because we knew this is the kind of thing. This is the future. This is this is the new reality. But pre Sam, pre pre Sammy days, how many how many staff did it, it take for us to pull off events like this, Ken? Okay, uh, it would kill me, but I would do all the production. <laughs> I actually did hire in some freelancers a couple times to help me out. Uh, actually, Sam came and freelance for me two or three times before we hired him. Um, but it would normally be our. T it just depends on the size of the uh, size of the event. Lena, how many people normally do you need for registration and all that for an event? Um. A uh, hundred people coming probably to our registration. COVID protocols added to it. We've added four because there's a lot more. But for back end, so for on topic, which we talked about, that luncheon hybrid, it would typically be Ken running the everything. And then we'd have um, a coworker online making sure everything looks good, telling us, hey, it's blurry. And right. then we'd also pre um <laughs> having like we just somebody holding up maybe a script that we were reading pre, you know, figuring out that we could put it on an awesome uh, computer behind the camera. Um, so honestly, like, could you do it with just me and Ken? Uh, yeah, we, we've done with that. Just but webinars, though, not the live. Those are webinars. Hybrid, I would definitely say yeah. four to five people. And then you had Sarah doing the networking. No, and then sit right. And then Sarah would be doing the networking as well as we were upstairs setting up the room for the hundred or 70 people that were coming. So yeah, you could do it with fewer, not, but that's going to be very stressful on fewer people. Correct. correct. Everyone had like a part to play. Yes. Maybe they weren't doing it the whole hour or two hours, but everyone had a part. And you got to communicate with your, your talkers, the people who are going to be live and let them know, look, we've got to be right on time. We've got to stay in front of the camera and you've got to make sure you're looking good and that your um, hair's not out of place and all of that because you're going to be on camera <laughs> and things like that. So there's all that that has to come into it too. Yep. Sarah. So next question is, um, what is, what does our pricing strategy look like for hybrid events with virtual price versus 
on-site price and or do we get any pushback for online attendees having to pay? Lena, Lena? that's yours. <laughs> We honestly have never gotten any pushback on our pricing. It's typically $10 less than the in-person or 15, depending on what they're getting. So if but the profits, just, the same, it profits the same. Absolutely. Yeah. If they're just, if we're just doing a recording, there's no networking, no, like no fun, Sarah, no gift card. Of course we make sure that price isn't going to be what it would be if we had the gift card or if we had the networking, which is what we typically have been doing. Um, so no pushback, um, just like I said, 10 to $15 under what a in-person person would um, be paying and it's worked so far. Yep. Uh, the next question is, are we requiring masks at our in-person event and are people following the rules? Lena? <laughs> um, so since we opened, our masks have been recommended um, and welcome. So the one event that we did have in mm, February, which our state of the county event, that was our first largest event we've held since last year. That was about 550 people that came together. So for that event, because it was a county event as well, that was a mask were required. And yes, everyone did wear their mask and everyone was great. There was never an issue. Um, but for all of our other events, they are recommended and welcomed. Um, and most people do wear them. Yeah, we've never really had anybody make a scene either way, you know, because you, as everybody knows, you've got the spectrum, you've got the never maskers and the always maskers, and we've never had anybody make a scene there. Some people might um, ask about the affidavit, and, you know, they're concerned about their privacy or whatever, and one lady that just refused to, to do it, we just, it was like, okay, fine, you know, we're not going to, twist your arm but what we're trying to do is get some general idea what what actually did happen on that lena do you recall on that? I, yeah i think um she ended up doing it after um okay. our ceo actually spoke to her and just explained to her we're doing this for the safety of everyone if wouldn't you want to know someone here tested yeah. positive because the um, contact tracing yeah. yeah yeah okay I think she was just like i don't know why i'm signing uh something i think she just didn't really read it yeah yeah um, and then the last question, it looks like, because a couple of the other questions we had answered during the, the process of the webinar, but last question is, have your events been longer than an hour? And if so, what did you do with the virtual attendees while you took breaks? Excellent question. Lena, do you want to take a shot at this? Because Moxie is probably yeah. the one that represents that most. Yeah, Moxie, Moxie is Small Business longer. Awards. Oh, and the Washington DC yeah. fly -in, the Washington DC fly -in, I'll talk about that. Go ahead. What we do is we split up. Um, so let's say the event in person starts at 10. We wouldn't have our virtual attendees join till 11 and start that networking. Let's say 1130 is when your speaker actually jumps on to talk. That's when that networking would be done and they would start watching the live feed of the speaker. Um, and then if there were a second break, um, which we we didn't have with Moxie. They just watched just straight through because it was a panel and then an awards. Um, when we did do the 10 minute break, we were like, hey guys, Sarah actually jumped on and was like, we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Great time to grab a drink, um, bathroom break, whatever, we'll be right back with you. Um, but yeah, just the big strategic there is don't start them when your event starts, start them after once the speaker is up, because if not, they're literally just going to sit there looking at each other. And if yeah, that is the case, do a networking piece, add yeah. some fun to it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's what we do with our uh, general membership meeting or on topic meetings is that we, when what we normally do in those situations without hybrid is that we'll welcome everybody, say a few words and then say, okay, enjoy your lunch. We'll be back in a minute. Well, what we do is we welcome everybody and say, thanks for being here. Okay, we'll, we'll everybody enjoy your lunch and be back in a minute. And that's when Sarah jumps on with the online people and they do their networking at that time. And then we have the speaker, the talker goes and <laughs> speaks to the virtual folks during that that's, time. That's kind of what we did with Small Business Awards. There was a break, um, a couple of breaks where we would get on and do some open networking and conversations and then um, the beginning of the small business award would start our ceo would welcome we'd have some some sponsor and speaker inter talker introductions um, we had this fantastic video that was produced for the event that we sh that was shown then and then we we broke for lunch um, and then 
I went back to networking with everybody online. We played some entrepreneur trivia. Um, and then once it was, um, once it was time for the, for the presentation or for the award show to actually begin, we went back and forth um, or back into the room for the live feed. So it's just breaking it up with networking and having somebody on there facilitating at all times. So they're not just sitting around looking at a screen of people. And by the way, awesome. before we were doing hybrid events, I would get to eat lunch. Yes, have, we all got to, to eat food. <laughs> food was so good then. <laughs> Lena, go ahead. Yeah, and you were also, say something. Key, yeah, key point of the actual, you know, what Sarah was talking about is make sure they have that in your agenda to your virtual attendees, just like your in person attendees always know you know, for an award program or whatever you're hosting, they see that agenda, have them know that in like at 1130, they're taking a break and for 10 minutes or that they're jumping on at 11, let them know that. Don't just expect them to know that they're just going to be sitting there the whole time. That really excites people. And it might help people with their schedule because if they're virtual, they might be simultaneously trying to work or whatever. So it really helps you communicating with them that agenda. Well, it really, it raises the question too, that you really should have one of your staff online the whole time to be talking with the folks. Absolutely. So if there is a break that they're saying to them, okay, now we're going to shut down this or not shut it down, but we're just going to go dormant for, you know, the next 10 minutes while we're waiting. This is a good time to have a bio break. And that's typically what Sarah would do. So it's always very much more personable to have somebody online with them so that they're kind of experiencing that online part too. I did see a question just pop up that um, I'm kind of excited to answer. It said, and Lena can elaborate, but I can definitely, we all three can answer it. But it says, did your in-person attendance ever drop to a point that you did not need to hold the in-person component? No, people have been raring to go to get back in person. And we've seen that since we got back in the office in May, people have just craved that safe in-person connection. And we have been so blessed that we did not have to let go of the in-person component. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. 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 And people are, they're champing at the bit to get uh, to the live events. We had one recently and one of the talkers got up and said, isn't it nice to be together again? And the place erupted in applause. It, and the people are ready. Yeah, they are. I think it's huge that we came from the beginning. We started and told them how we were going to make sure they would be safe and, and you know, everybody healthy. Like we, do, we did that from the beginning. We didn't just have them guessing what they were going to walk into. Um, it just goes back to that communication key, uh, like that point, but also just making sure that um, I think now we're actually, Ken and Sarah can attest, we're actually seeing a little bit of not so much virtual. Yeah, they really it's want to be in person. So it's, uh, we're kind of handling that, um, which each event, because all the events are different, where maybe our meetings, like if you have to attend a meeting, the people who'd be driving from the city maybe don't want to, they just want to join on Zoom. That's where we see it great. But we are seeing a little bit of uh, fluctuation with our virtual attendees now. Yeah. And I think, like Lena said, just to kind of drive that point home, being able to, from the get-go, from the jump off, to tell them we're going back in person, but this is how we are working nonstop to keep you safe, I think is the kicker. And I think it's that's where um, that's where everybody has to start, is just we're going to keep you safe. We're going to put a little humor in it, because if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. Um, but we're going to keep you safe here's how kind of thing. So I think telling everyone that from the get-go was vital in the success of anything that we've done past March 13th of last year. I think we're at the end time, right, Emily? We are, unfortunately. And I just need to thank all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. And also just for sharing so much of your resources with us. Um, I know the chamber community um, is very much a rip off and duplicate community, but it always amazes me uh, whenever people are just so open with their resources. So thank you so much. Thank and you, th Emily. <laughs> and thank you to all of our attendees today for participating. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be on our ACCE University page sometime tonight. I will make sure that the link for the, uh, um, why, why am I blanking on the, the, the virtual? high tail space, <laughs> high tail space. Yes. I know there was space in there. Um, 
the link for the high tail space as well as the copy of the slides and the uh, technology guide will be on there as well. Um, if we did not get to your question, please feel free to email me and I will make sure that we got to it, but I'm pretty sure we got to every single one of them, I believe, Sarah. But other than that, yes, I hope you have a great rest of your Thursday. Yes, Thursday. Have a wonderful day and I cannot wait to see you on the next ACC event. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>